Welcome to video one for week six. In this video, I want to talk about a particular class of vector fields called conservative vector fields. So a conservative vector field is a vector field F that is the gradient of some scalar field. We already know from previous calculus courses, if we have a scalar field and take its gradient, we get a vector field that indicates the direction of greatest change. That, vector that scalar field in this context is going to be called the scalar potential for the vector field. And that word potential should perhaps spark notions in your brain of potential energy, which it will turn into a potential energy field for force situations, which I'll talk about later in the video. But for now, the general definition is that a vector field is conservative if it is the gradient of some scalar field. Now, I know from previous videos that the curl of a gradient is zero. So since a conservative vector field is the gradient of some scalar field, then this equation applies and the curl of a, ve a conservative vector field must be zero. One thing I'm interested in is can I use this to actually identify conservative vector fields? It would be really nice if this were a check. So right now the direction of implication is that conservative implies irrotational. If the curl is zero, we call that irrotational. Is the converse true? Does irrotational also imply conservative? Well, to get there, I actually need to do a little bit of topology. The converse isn't immediate. The converse depends on a little bit of topology. So let me make some topology definitions. A set is called path connected if there's a parametric curve between any two points. So if I have some set in Rn, if I have a point here and point here, then if, there, if I can make a parametric curve between the two points that stays inside the set, and if I can do that for any two points in the set, then the set is called path connected. A parametric curve is called closed if its start and end points are the same. So if I have some curve, curve that starts here, goes around, it can loop, it can cross itself, but as long as it ends at the same place it starts, then it's called a closed curve. And that lets me make the last definition here that a set is simply connected if all closed paths can be contracted to points. So say I have a closed path in a set, so here's a set here, and say I have a closed path. By contracted, I mean that the curve can be continuously shrunk down. And there's a whole theory for this called homotopy theory, which we're not gonna get into here. Uh, we're going to speak a little bit informally here, but the idea is that I could shrink this down and contract it down to a point, and I could do that while staying inside the set. Now, if the set had a hole in it, if this uh, were a something missing from the set, the shaded region, and if I had a curve here, this curve cannot be contracted while remaining in the set because I'd have to cross over this shaded region, and that can't be done while remaining in the set. So if you want to think of simply connected, think of th about things that don't have holes in them. So sets that really don't have any points missing or, or empty sections in the middle of them that would prevent me from taking a path and shrinking it down to a point while staying in the set. There's a lot of theory and mathematics about simply connected sets. We're basically only going to need them for the next result which is the converse of what I said. So I said before that all conservative vector fields are irrotational. I would like that to also have a converse, and the converse is that it works on simply connected open sets. In calculus and in analysis in general, often what we need topology for is these kind of things. A lot of calculus, even though it depends on complicated functions and derivatives, a lot of the results from it depend on the underlying topological nature of the sets you're working on. This is a good example. I'm not going to give the proof here, but the proof relies on this condition that you need to contract these paths to points. So the, the converse only works on simply connected open sets. That means that we have a check. If we have a vector field and we take the curl and the curl is zero, and if that works on a simply connected open set, so if we can restrict the domain of F to a simply connected open set, then we can conclude that F is conservative on that set. All right, we have conservative vector fields. They're coming from potentials. They are the gradients of some scalar fields, which I call a potential. I'd like to calculate those potentials. So let me talk about how to calculate the potential of a conservative vector field. So the equation f equals nabla little f, 
which is the definition of a conservative vector field. In components, it says the first component of the vector field f is the x derivative of little f, the second component of f is the y derivative of little f, the third component of f is the z derivative of little f. That's just expanding this in components. Well, if I want to calculate little f, I can integrate these three equations, integrate this, integrate this, integrate this, I get three integral equations. And each of these integral equations I'll integrate in wherever the variable was here, x, y, and z. So that gives me the variables of integration x, y, and z there. And when I integrate these, I'm going to get constants. And since I'm integrating in x, the constants here can involve the other variables y and z. If I'm integrating in y, the constants can involve x and z. If I'm integrating in z, the constants can involve x and y. Now this is, in general, a pretty difficult thing to do, to try and find these integrals and try and choose these g1, g2, and g3 to make it work. But under reasonable circumstances, this can often be done. And if this works, we're going to get a function, and the constant that's left over, once we sort of put all the pieces together, is just going to be an ordinary constant of integration. And this is, in fact, a nice result that conservative vector fields come from potentials, and the potentials can only, in fact, differ by a constant. So if I have two different potentials for the same field, you know the two potentials only differ by an actual constant. All right, let me give an example of how to actually do this three integral equation thing. So say I have this vector field. You could check that this vector field is irrotational by taking the curl, curl uh, nabla cross f equals zero. This vector field is defined everywhere, so defined in all of R3. All of R3 is simply connected. If you have a curve in R3 and the domain is everywhere, there are no holes in R3, you can contract it down to a point. So the converse works. So I, since I can check that the curl is zero, I've not shown that calculation, but I could do it. I know this is conservative. I know it comes from potential. So I'm going to take the first component and integrate in x. I'm going to take the second component and integrate in y. I'm going to take the third component and integrate in z. That's how I do this. So the integral of this is sine xy. The integral of this is also sine xy. The integral of this is z squared, and then I have these constants running around. And then what I want to do is I want to take these three things and say, can I choose g1, g2, and g3 that make sense of this all? And I can. I can choose g1 and g2 to be this z squared piece, and I can choose g3 to be this sine xy piece, such that if I put them together, I get that the potential has to be sine xy plus z squared. And then, of course, I add this constant of integration at the end because the potential can differ by a constant. That's the general setup. I want to look at my three equations and see if I can choose g1, g2, and g3 carefully such that this works. Here's another example with polynomials. So here's my first component. Here's my second component. Here's my third component. I integrate the first component in x. I integrate the second component in y. I integrate the third component in z. I've not shown those integrals. I add the other functions at the end, and I say, well, can I actually make this work? Well, all three of these have 3xy squared z, which is good. Two of these have x cubed y, so I can put that here, and I can assume that x cubed y is part of g3. Two of these have x squared y squared, I can put that here, and I can assume that x squared y squared is part of g1, or perhaps all of g1. And two of these have negative 4x squared z squared, I can assume that that's part of g2. And in that sense, each piece that's missing from each of these, I can actually match in to part of these extra functions. So in that way, I can put together all four pieces. Note that none of the three equations have all four pieces. I really need to take all three equations and put them together to get all four pieces of the potential and then and a constant. And so that's my potential for this field. Again, this field is defined everywhere. You could take the curl and calculate the curl equals zero to know that this is conservative, to know that you can look for a potential. Lastly, in this video, I want to give some thoughts about potential energy. So the idea behind the term potential is really thinking about energy. So if F is a force, force of gravity, electromagnetic force, those forces come from an understanding of potential energy. Those forces are conservative forces. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of videos. But they come from potentials. We can describe a conservative force as the gradient of a potential energy. The fact that a potential energy is varied up to a constant is interesting. This means that whenever you do a potential energy for a force, 
you've got to choose a constant base level. And this brings up the idea that energy is in some ways a fiction. Unlike mass and charge, for example, there's nothing sort of intrinsic about the level of energy. Speaking here in classical mechanics, I'm not going to get into relativity and quantum, which make these things much more confusing. But just in classical Newtonian physics, energy is not in the same category as mass and charge. A thing has a certain mass. You can choose your units for that mass, but you can't really decide, well, let's treat mass as negative. That doesn't make sense. Potential energy, you get to choose the base level however you wish. You can choose potential energy to start at zero at any point you want. You can choose it to start at any number you want. So in that sense, energy really is a something we make up to describe a situation. But it is a useful fiction because it describes the behavior of objects. Typically, we want to say that objects want to reduce their potential energy. And that also raises a uh, another small little issue here, that gradients point to the direction of increase. But the principle of physics says that objects want to reduce their potential energy. They want to move in a direction that loses potential energy. So the force that comes from the gradient of potential energy should actually have a negative sign. And this confusion, the fact that gradients increase but potential energy wants to decrease, this is going to cause us a little bit of a headache all through this discussion. Anytime we're talking about forces and potential energies, this negative sign is going to have to float around and we have to remember it at the right point in the calculations to make sense of what we're doing, is that the force should in fact be the negative gradient of potential energy.